right, guys. Good morning, family. How's everybody doing today? Good, man. I just want to say uh, a big thank you to everyone who attends TWC, um, especially right now. I know it's inconvenient with what's going on on Upland, and it's not easy to get in here and get out of here. And I just appreciate you going through all of that uh, to help us. And they, they say that little project over there is going to take two months. Um, we're working on a solution that may, we may have in place in two weeks. And so, yeah, I just pray that God gives us favor with a couple of things. And that's if South Plains Electric will, will work with us a little bit. We could tear down that chain link fence and use their driveway to get into our driveway. And so maybe they'll give us favor and we can do that. If not, we're looking at about two months. But here's what I would tell you. Um, there's a big field right across the street. And people say, do we have permission to park there? We, we don't not know if we can park there. Um, we called, no one answered. No, so, so uh, several times. And so uh, we used it for Easter. And actually, uh, if you do park there, just claim that. We're, we're trying to buy that three acres right there to turn into a parking lot. You know, here's what I found out. Parking lots aren't sexy, but you got to have them. Come on, somebody. And so uh, we're hoping to get that purchased and we can buy that parking lot. We'll have more parking across the street. And I know it's across the street, but we don't have a lot of options where we're at, right? Unless somebody wants to write a big check, and we'll take that today, by the way. Uh, we'll go build whatever you'd like us to build. There's actually some land that we have looked at and we intend, on, after we secure the land across the street, we intend on purchasing about 30 acres uh, to build uh, the future of TWC whenever that should be. So yeah, amen. Isn't that exciting? I, I don't know when that'll happen. Uh, I may not build it. Hunter may build it when he's my pastor. I, I don't know. Uh, but if he does, he better give me a parking lot on this side of the street because I'm too old and fat to drive across there. So uh, anyway, uh, thank you all. I just want to say that. And I know that there's some inconveniences. When you pull out of here, they're asking you to turn right and all of that stuff. And, and we announced that last service for everybody to turn right. And everybody has agreed with it. And as soon as we said that, people were running over the cones out there. And just so you know, we don't want to buy those every Sunday. And we're going to have to replace about five cones. This, this, they tore up some of them. And I was like, what are you doing, sir? Sir, what are you doing? And people say, it's not us. Listen, you go work that parking lot ministry for a week, and you'll be glad Jesus died for all your sins. <laughs> it, it is tough out there. It is hard out there in those streets of the parking lot. <laughs> and so I appreciate all those guys that serve. So let's jump right into this this morning. I don't have a lot to say about the game last night, so let's get right into this. Um, how about that drone show, huh? Come on. <laughs> Thank God for the drone show. I got to preach, so let me get into this. Man, I lost my joy so bad yesterday. I had great seats. Somebody blessed me with seats. Um, and I sat in the New South End Zone in the corner, and it was awesome, just awesome sitting there. And it was awesome for the first half. It was just glorious. And then, I don't know what happened. And then my University of Texas fans reminded me this morning, we won like 70 to nothing. That's what we did, Pastor Todd. And what I said to them was like, your record's 1-0 and and ours is 1-0, and so now what? So I get childish. Here we go. Today, we're going to talk about baggage, and we're going to talk about the baggage of guilt. And what saddens my heart is how many believers struggle with the guilt factor. And I want you to notice that I didn't say how many unbelievers I'm talking about believers. I'm talking people that have saved. They know they're saved. They know they're going to heaven, but they carry around shame and guilt. And it beats them up, and they, they disqualify themselves. Man, I can't serve here because I did this. I can't do this because of this happened. And I just think that we are cheapening what Jesus did on the cross by not accepting everything he did on the cross. And if God can forgive you, why about you forgive yourself this morning? Would it be okay if you left this place better than the way you came today? Amen. At our South Campus, I believe that. I believe that at our Brownfield Campus. Don't forget, also next Sunday starts our new service times, 9, 11, and 1. And if those service times don't fit you, South Campus still has 9.30 and 11.30. And Pastor Jimmy has assured me that he has enough room for everybody. And if everybody showed up over there, the new service times for the next week would be 9, 11, and 1. So, yeah, amen. So, wouldn't that be awesome for 
it to grow over there too. So guilt causes you to view God uh, the wrong way. And if you leave it undealt with, you learn to compensate, you learn to carry things that you were never meant to carry. How many of you know if he's the good shepherd, that means that you are his sheep and sheep aren't burden bearing animals. You were never meant to carry the amount of weight that you're carrying. And when I grew up, I grew up in a, in a church that was very legalistic, very strict, and, 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 and they gave me, honestly, the wrong view of God. And really, I've met a lot of Christians that have given me a bad view of God or a wrong view of God. And what do you mean by that? They tell me everything they, they're against, and I never really learn what they're for. And so many people are telling everybody what they're against that we never hear how good God is and how gracious God is. And, and I had a pastor that, that preached on hell like every week and like he drove in from hell to preach. I mean, he knew about it good and how hot it was and how bad it was gonna be. And, and, and I say that because he gave me a, a bad view of God and it was discouraging. And I felt like there's nothing I could ever do that is gonna make him love me. There's nothing I can ever do that is uh, gonna uh, make Make him uh, forgive me, and it was discouraging. There's nothing I could believe to please him, and that's why you have to have a personal relationship with God, and that's why the Bible says, taste and see that God is good. I don't care that your mama knew God. I don't care that your daddy knew God. I don't care if your granny knew God. I, am I don't care if your pastor knows God or your TV preacher knows God. You need to know God for yourself. Taste and see that he's good. Can you say Amen. Because there's a lot of people that'll tell you, man, like, this tastes good, taste it. You ever ran into those people? Oh, you got to taste this, and you taste it, and you're like. <laughs> you ever had those people invite you to their house, and like, hey, come over, man, I make this, and it's the best you've ever had, and you're going, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's just not the best you've ever had? Anybody know what I'm talking about? I have people that tell me, I got the best barbecue in the world, and I taste that barbecue, and I'm like, oh, you're so sad. You don't know what good barbecue is. You, do, you don't know. And, and, and I, have people that, I have people that tell me they don't like watermelon. And I'm like, you're not going to heaven. There's, there's, there's no hope for you. That is the fruit of the Spirit is watermelon. And it's, it's one of them. Okay. And so people tell me that thing. So if I went by them, or then I have people tell me this thing. Because I, like, I love ice cream and I'm diabetic. And they're like, Pastor Todd, try this sugar-free ice cream. What is wrong with you? <laughs> Have you tried the sugar-free ice cream? And if you say it's good, <laughs> you're a liar. It's not good. You, know, you haven't tried this one. <laughs> I don't guess what, I'm not gonna. <laughs> You know why? Because they got sugar ice cream, huh? And so I just, people, but if you don't learn to taste and see that the Lord is good for yourself, you'll take everybody else's opinion and their view, and you may never know how good he really is. Amen? You'll never know how good he is. And, and I want to say this, lifting weights is only good at the gym. You weren't meant to carry the weight that you carried in here this morning. You're not meant to carry those burdens. It's no good for believers to carry around that stuff. And, and, and what you do when you carry around unnecessary baggage, it's like a self-imposed prison. You lock yourself up, and you're trying to pay a debt back to God, and Jesus has already paid that debt back to God. You can't pay it. It's already been paid for. Matthew chapter 11 says this. Come to me, all of you who are tired from carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. The reason some of you here this morning and listening online are so slap wore out is because you're carrying a load that you were never meant to carry. It's, it's not because the devil's after you. It's not because God's not for you. God is for you. He's already done everything he needs to do. It's just that you're still carrying around shame and guilt. And shame and guilt was nailed to the cross. It's not yours to carry anymore. So you may be exhausted carrying around something that you could be releasing today. You could walk out of here better than the way you came this morning. You cannot, if you're not a note taker, write this down. You cannot fix your life apart from God. It's impossible. No, I'm going to do it. How long have you been doing it? I got people that are 50 and 60 years old still trying to fix your life. Aren't you tired? If you could have fixed it, don't you think you could have done it in your 20s or 30s? You still fighting the same thing at 50 and 60 and 40 years old that you was fighting when you was younger. 
And now you're not as strong as you were when you were 20 or 30 or 40. How much of your life are you willing to give up that Jesus has already paid for so you don't have life and not just life but more abundant? Come on, somebody stay with me. You need to get rid of that this morning. And it's a good day to stop running from God and start running to him. I, I mean, look at this promise. He says, bring me your heavy load and I'll give you rest. Guilt will spin Everything that you have. The Bible says that we are crucifying them all over again when we allow guilt to participate in our lives. And, and, and when, when God wants us to be forgiven, Psalms 38, he says, my guilt has overwhelmed me like a heavy burden to bear. Every time in the Bible a hero of faith had guilt that was so overwhelming, they couldn't do what God was asking them to do. They were constantly trying out to out, talk God out of what he said he could be. And, and, and that's what I love about the Bible. It tells you what our heroes did right, and it tells you what our heroes did wrong. But when they got stuck and stopped going for it is when they would not allow God to forgive them, and they would not believe that God still wants to use them. Listen, I don't care if you're here this morning and you still got a little paper that your name is still on some paperwork. I don't care that you've had two or three abortions. I don't care that you're on the third or fourth marriage. I don't care how many times you've been in now of jail. If God has forgiven you, let that thing go and quit disqualifying yourself. You are talking yourself out of what God died for you to be, and you're hiding. You won't tell anybody about the abortion. You won't tell anybody about the abuse. You won't share anything about the addiction. Do you understand that your story is God's glory, and somebody could get set free because they know somebody else that got set free? That's why I never hide from my testimony. I don't care who's mad. You shouldn't be a preacher because you're an ex-drug addict. Well, you shouldn't be allowed to go to church. Well, how makes you say that? Well, judge not lest you be judged. You're not qualified to judge me. I ain't qualified to judge you. There's only one that's qualified, and his name is Jesus. You're not good at it. You can't. You look, if I judged everybody, all the Longhorn fans, let them go to heaven. <laughs> not one. And I'm really close on Jerry Jones not getting to go too. <laughs> He's ruining the silver star. And so people are like, Pastor Todd, you, got, you think too much about this stuff. I do. I do. Somebody texted me last night and said, Pastor Todd, you, what you need to do is put the, the Red Raiders on your altar and pray for them. I said, I don't want them on my altar right now. I'm mad at them. <laughs> They'll mess it up. But I'm just telling you, we carry around stuff that we shouldn't be carrying around, and we're disqualifying ourselves. Quit hiding from your past and start sharing it so other people can know that they can get set free. There is somebody in this church this morning that needs to know that, 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 that there is life after the abortion. There is somebody in this church this morning that needs to know that you can overcome addiction. Huh? A little girl, first service, a, a, a teenager grabs me with her dad and says, Pastor Todd, I was back in the back. Can I talk to you for a minute? Says, yes. I just want to tell you, this is my dad. And my dad has been sober for five days. That is why I do the worship center. That is my whole why. Why do you do it? Why? Because people need to still be set free, and they need to know they can get free. And if you're here today and you're on day one, don't worry about Monday. Let's just worry about Sunday. And if we wake up tomorrow, we'll, we'll, we'll battle on Monday. Come on. Don't battle Monday yet. You just live in today. One day at a time. And if you stumble, then you don't have to stay down. If you stumble, pick yourself back up because God is for you. And you got a church that is behind you. I don't care how many times you fall. I care about how many times you get back up. If you're going to struggle, let's struggle together. Your story is vital, man. Quit hiding. Let shame and guilt quit for, uh, keep you from telling your story. In the book of Genesis, they teach you in Bible school the law of first order, which means if you really want to know uh, the purity of a concept or an idea, you have to go back to its original intent. And the original intent of what God wanted with you, you see with Adam and Eve. 
He wanted you to be able to walk around in the cool of the day with him and enjoying his presence. They had no regret. They had nothing hidden. They weren't competing. They were in a childlike relationship. But after guilt moved in, watch it. what happens. When guilt comes, they became childish and they started pointing a finger at one another and they started blaming each other. Let me show it to you in Genesis chapter 2. The man and his wife were both naked. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. Some of you men, you better learn how to shout when I give you a help. I'm trying to help you, sir. You tell your wife, the Bible said we was both naked in the name of Jesus. Mm. Go on and put it on the floor. It looks better than the carpet anyway. Hey! And if you ain't married, keep your clothes on. Even if you're dating, don't even give them a slip. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Clothe yourself in righteousness. <laughs> you can make anything for you. Uh, when I leave here, I'm going to get some bluebell ice cream. And, and, uh, the man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Listen to me. The only good, there is one good thing that came out of the curse. The only good thing was clothes. <laughs> If you don't think clothes is important, think about this. You're sitting in a chair somebody sat in naked last week. Oh, see, oh. And you don't know whether they be washing or not washing. Come on, somebody. You better thank Jesus for some clothes and wear them right. Get you a roommate to help you dress. Anyway, let me go home. God, <laughs> I seen some people at a game last night. They just barely holding on for life. Like, man, they got a T. I mean, this guy had on a text shirt. It was a lady, too. A lady had one of them tops where you tie it right here. I'm like, girl, go on and loose that. Let that flag go. <laughs> you, this hole right here was showing, and I was like, nobody is hitting on that. I promise you, no. <laughs> Same thing if I was walking around like that, like, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> nobody trying to hit on that. Like, Put some clothes on. <laughs> See what goes through my head? Pray for your pastor. God wants you to be innocent like a child. He doesn't want us to be childish. He wanted to walk with them, and he showed up for his walk, and they hid because of guilt. Listen to me. We get told that God is mad at us, that God is angry at us. If everything in the Bible is true, everybody believe that? If God is so mad and he's so angry and he's so faithful, how come he showed up to walk in the garden with them after they sinned? He showed up with them because I want to tell you, your sin doesn't change the character of God. Your sin doesn't change the nature of God. God will always show up like he's always shown up. It don't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. God will always show up for you. You got to realize, am I going to show up for him? But God showed up for them just like he'd always done. But guilt causes you to hide. And in order to get rid of it, you can't hide. Think about it. When they really needed to be close to God is when they were really good at running away from him. I'm preaching better than you're amen. -ing. There are times when you really, really need God. Rather than running to him, you're running from him because of shame. But God craves for us to be free from chains and baggage. Galatians chapter 5 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Paul just said, be careful because you're going to have a tendency to want to go back to baggage. You're going to want to have a tendency to go back to an old mindset. But it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. So when that tendency shows up, stand firm in the work of the cross and in the blood of the Lamb and know that you have been set free in the name of Jesus. I have people that tell me all the time, Todd, I, I, I believe God loves me, and, and I believe God has forgiven me. But if you dig on it really, really hard, they'll say, but I've got one or two things in my life that, that I think he holds against me. I've got one or two things that I think I hold against me as well. Your opinion cannot be greater than the master of the universe. 
You can't, you lost your keys this week. You lost your children this week. And some of y'all didn't go look for them. Come on. <laughs> it's God's will that they show back up, bless the Lord. It's, I had them long enough. I turned them over to the Lord in Jesus' name. <laughs> you lost your phone this week. Some of us forgot to pay a bill. We came home and we're like, got no lights. What happened? You forgot to pay the bill. Someone like that can't be in charge of, did God forgive me? Is my opinion bigger than his or is his opinion bigger than mine? Are you understanding me? Here's one of the best stories I'm ever going to tell you. And I'm going to tell you because she's not here today. Pastor Jocelyn came home one day to their house and, and half the house was, electricity was working and half the house wasn't. So she goes, Mo, she goes, I need you to come home right now. Something's wrong. And when he gets there, he's looking around. And he's, she says, half the house works and half the house doesn't work. So he goes and flips, and sure enough, it doesn't. And she goes, what do you think is wrong? And straight face, he said to her, he goes, you know what? I only paid half the bill. <laughs> and she straight up said, you better go pay the other half right now. <laughs> Just right. <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is one of our worship pastors is really pretty. <laughs> very, <laughs> very pretty. I always just look at her and go, you're so pretty. <laughs> but, but, but we do the same thing. We laugh about what I just said, but we know all about the power of Christ and we only live in half that power. Because I'm telling you, shame and guilt, it got nailed when it... When he went like this, all your shame, all your guilt got nailed. Everything, everything you've done wrong got nailed to the cross. Everything you're going to do wrong got nailed to the cross. Don't live in half the power of the cross. Live in the power of the fullness of the cross. Somebody say amen. amen. This is what happens when guilt holds on to you. Some of you came to church right now because you feel guilty. Some read the word of God because they think it's a duty. And, and, and some read the word because they're in love with the word of God. Some make themselves go to church. Others are there because the, the presence of God is here. And, and they want to be wherever he is because wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there's true freedom. Well, Todd, what are guilt contributors? Let me tell you this. Number one, when you have painful regret, that's a guilt contributor. It's amazing how good we're at keeping score in relationship. But the Bible says we don't keep records of wrong. But but yet we do, and when you do that, you have a bent to believe that God does that as well. But our frailties do not change the enormities of who our God is. Listen, if you have a hard time forgiving people, it's probably because you have a hard time receiving forgiveness. You make people earn it because you think you have to earn it. And you have options every day to go the world's standards and beliefs or the truth of God's world. See, sin is only for a season, and you're going to find out the world is offering you false advertisement. I have never heard, I've been doing this for 33 years, I have never heard anybody say, I've regretted serving God. Not one person. I, I've never heard anybody say, I wish I would have went after the world more. I, I've never heard anybody say, I wish I had lied more. I wish I would have stole more. I wish I would have cheated more. I wish I would have compromised more. I've never heard anybody say that. But you know what I wish? I wish I would have came sooner. I wish I wouldn't have wasted so much time. I wish I would have ran to him when he was running to me. Oh, you're not hearing what I'm telling you. That's what I wish. If you really, I wish I didn't wait till I was 21 years old. I wish I'd have done at five years old and what and I can say all the days of my life I have served God I can't say that but what I am glad about is when I did it at 21 I have a God that redeems all the 21 years that I wasted he redeemed he's God's the only one that can redeem time Paul knew something about regret he's killing Christians and one day he's overseeing the murder of Stephen Stephen got murdered simply because of freedom. He got killed because of freedom and walking in. And the religious people, church people, could not, they could not accept Stephen being set free. They were so mad that he got delivered. Isn't it crazy that we go to church that preaches about freedom and everybody's mad when you get free? 
and they're jealous of when you get free, and they have accusations. I don't know how they can sit there with their hands up, rolled up that, like that. I know where they've been. I know what they've been doing. I saw them last night at the club, but what was you doing at the club? I had people all the time tell them, that's the whole problem. When, the, when they brought the woman that got caught in adultery, and they bring her out, and they say, bring her out. We caught her in adultery. What was you doing on that side of town? What were the religious do? We've seen her in the act. Why are you peeking in the windows? Look at the church. I'm saying, read it. Go back and read it. We caught her in the act. You nasty is what you is. You looking through... And they call that religion. There are so many things that get done in the name of God that have nothing to do with the name of God. And God is not interested in your religion. He doesn't care about your little fish tattoo that you got. He doesn't care about your cross tattoo. He don't care that you got a scripture tattooed on your wrist, whatever it is. He wants to know, has the blood of Christ been applied to your sins? That's what he cares about. He don't care if you grew up Catholic. He don't care if you grew up Baptist. He don't care if you grew up Methodist. He don't care if you grew up heathen, which is half of us. Come on, somebody. He don't care about that. Because when we get to heaven, they won't be Church of Christ. They won't be Methodist. They won't be Baptist. They won't be Assembly of God. They'll be the body of Christ. So if you stuck on, well, my mama said we got to be raised this way. What you going to do in heaven when we all go into the same church with the same name? You understand when we get to heaven, the first that we're going to fall on our knees and we're going to worship him. There will be a church in heaven. You know what the name of the church is going to be? The worship center. (laughs) Come on, somebody. Where you, all the people that don't like the worship center are going to have to tell people in heaven, I go to the worship center. <laughs> I used to go to church on the rock, but I, <laughs> I used to go to Trinity and Socrates, but now I'm at the worship center. I'm just going to sit there and go. I was way ahead of y'all jokers. That's a, look here. Watch what Paul's saying. See how my mind works? Pray for your pastor. Acts chapter 7. When they heard this, this is the religious crowd, they're furious, and they gnashed their teeth at him. That's what I was doing at the football game last night. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing. Don't miss this. Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I have seen an open, uh, heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And this they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, which later on becomes Paul. But I want to take something out of here that I think a lot of believers miss when they're reading this the bible says this when jesus left heaven or when left earth and he went to heaven it says that he is seated at the right hand of the father and he does not get up from that seat until god says son go get back my children everybody agree with that that's what the bible says but stephen said when i looked up in heaven i saw jesus standing at the right hand of god can i tell you there are things that you can do for the kingdom that will make Jesus Christ give you a standing ovation himself that there are things that Jesus he stood up and Stephen that is my son well done Stephen I'm proud of you Stephen thanks for not giving up Stephen keep on going don't give up don't give out that same God is saying to some of you this morning don't give out and don't give in I am standing and cheering for you this morning you better get that in your spirit Paul should have had a ton of regret. He hated the church. Hated so much. He killing people for going to church. And then ain't this a mess? God calls people, God calls a guy killing people for going to church to go plant church. Paul, all of our doctrine, all of our theology comes from a murderer. Paul. And can you imagine how hard it was for Paul to plant a church? Hey, man, we're going to have church today. Y'all going to come? Mm-mm. 
Now today, Paul, last week, you, you took out 27. 27 people showed up for church, and you're pow, pow, pow. You just popping people. I am you not, not today, Lucifer. He should have been filled with all kinds of horror. Think about it. I know we've been fun, but I want you to think about the seriousness. He should have been filled with all kinds of horror for killing innocent people. But he had an encounter with God on the road of Damascus. And he sees Jesus eye to eye, face to face. And this is after Jesus resurrected. You need to know he's all through. The, he's in the Old Testament too. I can show you sometime. And, and he sees him eye to eye. And because he saw Jesus the right way, not through the way somebody else told him, because he tasted and saw that it was good for himself, that he pins these words. Paul says, I am totally convinced that after my encounter with Jesus, that there are no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Listen to me. I want you to really lean into this. If you are living under condemnation this morning, it is illegally attached to you. If you are a child of God, condemnation is illegally attached to you. That's a good place to say amen. There's a difference between condemnation and conviction. Condemnation will always talk about where you've been and what you've done and give you no hope. Conviction will talk about where you're at and where you can go and give you hope. That's the difference. Conviction is God's love letter to our soul. Here's the second thing that contributes to our guilt when you hold on to it. 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things, how many things? Old things have passed away, and how many things? All, somebody say all. all. All things have become new. Now, some of us know how sorry we used to be. And if you don't know, let me tell you, you used to be sorry. Look at your neighbor and say, you used to be sorry. Look at your second choice, because they need to know too. They were sorry. But God, now go back and tell them, but God made all things new. Oh, that's so good, that's so good. The facts may say you did something wrong, but the guilt associated with says you are wrong. Don't miss me. The facts may be true that you failed, but condemnation, when you mix it into it, it the baggage of guilt tells you that you are a failure. The enemy sees that you lied. The Holy Spirit will tell you, don't lie anymore. Be honest about it. Make the phone call. Make it right. The conviction of the Holy Spirit always gives you a way out. Condemnation says you're a liar. That's just who you are. You're not serving God. You're nothing. And the weight of that will hold you down, which leads to the next contributor of guilt, which is this. When you don't allow God to forgive you and cover your sins, you live in guilt. Listen, every sin has to be paid for. And either you're going to have to pay for your sins, which, which guilt is a form of payment, or you can let Jesus pay for your sins. Without him, you, sh you should hide in guilt. But with him, there's no way you should ever do that. Just because you have an issue forgiving other people doesn't mean there's a lack in Jesus. It just means you don't understand that you've been forgiven. See, Jesus is very good at forgiving people. It's like one of my favorite movies, Nacho Libre. Nachos, when Jesus forgives people, he is the best. Now, you're going to go to work this week, and people are going to ask you, what did your preacher preach on? You say, I don't know, but it was the best. There are so many people who are not here today. There are so many people that are not watching online. There are so many people that won't go back to church because they don't know or they won't believe this one thing. And that is God wants to forgive you. It's his nature. He's the best at doing it. And he's the best at giving people a million chances. I don't know about you, but I didn't need a, next, I didn't need a second chance. I needed a millionth chance. Times one, I mean, plus one. Come on, somebody. I needed them over and over and over again, and I'm so glad that our God is the best at doing that. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That's what God talking to us. When you're weak, he's strong. Therefore, Paul says, I'm going to boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. Paul says, I'm going to tell my story and make it his glory. I'm not going to let the church shame me for what I've done. I'm going to let everybody know that God can set you free so that Christ's power, he says, I'm going to do it. Watch what happens when you let God shine through your weakness. Christ's power is going to rest on me. Oh, 
That's bad right there. Christ's power is going to rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weakness. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Salvation and grace are a gift from God. If, it were, if it's works, it can't be grace. It can't be both. But, but many feel like we have to fix our lives to get to God. Well, when I quit doing this, then I'm, I'm going to get really in church. When, when I quit doing, look, 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 you, you can't do it without him. If you could do it, don't you think it'd already be done? How many times, how long you've been telling yourself, once you get it done, you're going to get it? You're wasting days and you're wasting time. Who do you think wants to waste your life away? The enemy, because he knows, listen to me, the enemy knows if some of you get free, you're going to go free other people. And he can't let that happen. And so he convinces you of a lie that this is the best you'll ever be and you never get free and you never go set people free. Can you imagine if I would have just set on my testimony of what the Lord delivered me from drugs would have done? I'm not bragging on me. I'm bragging on Jesus. You know that last week we had over 3,000 people at the worship center. All the glory of the Lord. That's all the glory. That ain't got nothing to do with Todd. But what I will tell you is what would have happened if I would have done nothing with it? If I wouldn't have stepped out on a yes and just believed God could set me free? Are you, are you seeing what I'm trying? I'm not saying I'm the end all be all. Don't, meet, don't leave him. Pastor Todd thinks he's best thing since Big Red. No one is that good. And if you don't like Big Red, that's another reason you won't go to heaven. Big Red and watermelon are going to keep you out of there. People say, I don't like watermelon. Oh. Listen, if you got to work for it, it's not grace. I said this before. Jesus doesn't love you when you change. He loves you so you can change. Think about you, uh, you NFL guys. You're going to watch NFL today. You can go home, watch whatever team you, you watch for. And, and somewhere in that stadium, there's going to be a sign that, that's going to say John 316. Somebody's going to have it on there. I guarantee you somewhere today when you're watching football, somebody will have the sign. What we've been told to believe is that God only loves believers. That one verse, let's just take, get rid of the rest of the Bible. That one verse disproves that whole theory. Because that verse says this, for God so loved the world, not the church. For God so loved the world, not the believers. For God so loved the world. Understand, God loved you before you got right. Come on. The reason, and that's the way you can get right. Without his love, you can't do it. That's grace. So God doesn't love you so, uh, 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 for you to change. God loves you so you can change. It's a jacked up mentality to think you've got to fix yourself and then come to Jesus. That's like standing outside the shower thinking you got clean. Remember these little kids, you take a bath and you just ran to water and you didn't get in? No, just me? Okay, I was a dirty kid in class, all right. Maybe that's why I didn't win class favorite, okay? Let me tell you something, that you will go crazy trying to do your life apart from Jesus because it's impossible that you when you do it on works and not grace. Let me show it to you, Romans chapter 11. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. But if it's of works, it is no longer grace, otherwise work is no longer work. Are you catching that? It's crazy, but we, but because that, the way many of us are taught, we would prefer for God to tell us, okay, you got to crawl on your knees and you got to pay penance. Catholic Church teaches you got to pay penance. That's the whole thing. And where you grew up Catholic or not, I'm not trying to offend you, but it says, all right, after you ask for forgiveness from the Father, then you got to go do this many Hail Marys and you got to do this many of those things. If Jesus did it on the cross, why I got to go pray all those beads? That's works. That's penance. You don't have to pay penance. And this may be a real deal breaker for you. The Father can't forgive you. Only the Father in heaven can forgive you. I can't forgive you. I don't have the authority to forgive you. I don't have the, the ability to forgive you. Only Jesus can do that. But God says, no, you're earning it when you do it that way. I just want you to get on your knees and pray. I don't need you to get on your knees and crawl and beg. I've already paid the price. And so let me cover the tab. He didn't even want to split it with you. 
He wants to cover the whole thing. And you're like, Todd, I owe God. Yes, you do. You know what you owe him? Praise and worship. And let's worship him for doing something that we couldn't do because it's impossible for any of us to pay us back. That's why when you come to church and you stand like this, it's, I'm under contract to worship when I get here. I realize I ought to be dead or in the grave or... or, or locked up or still strung out. So when I come, I got to thank God that he did for me what I couldn't do for myself. Come on, man. Get them hands out of your pocket and give God a little glory when you come to church. Well, it's just not me. No, it's, that's a lie. That is a lie straight from hell. You were created to worship him. You were created to praise him. What has done is the world has taken your praise out of you. But if you would let go and let God, you would find yourself from here. You might even get to holding a TV or rocking a baby. Come on, somebody. You may even go, how you Baptist may go half mass. Y'all may get right here and make sure nobody looking, nobody looking. And then one day, you're going to be full-blown Pentecostal like uh, Mary Catherine Gallagher. superstar <laughs> why because you realize what he did for you amen Paul the murderer wrote this Romans chapter a uh, eight no in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us for I am convinced Paul said I met him on the road I looked Jesus eye to eye I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons neither the present nor the future nor any powers neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord Paul the murderer wrote that. Romans 8 also talks about us being justified through Christ. You know what justified means? Justified means justify. I had never done it. That's how much forgiveness he has. In Romans chapter 7, he actually got extremely honest. Paul did. And Paul says, man, I want to serve God. I don't know if any of you have ever been here. But Paul said, I want to serve God, but I, keep this e I got this evil that I keep on doing. And I don't want to do the evil. I want to do good. But every time I try to do good, evil shows up and starts talking in my ear. Evil says it's okay. Evil says it's just this one time. Evil says just go on and do it. And there's a, a, a raging war against the law of my mind and it makes me a prisoner. It takes me back into baggage, Paul says. Then I don't know what to do and who is going to rescue me from this body of death. And then he got it right and he said, thanks be to Jesus Christ our Lord that there is a, no way out of pain except by the power of the cross. Somebody say Amen. All right, Todd, I hear you. I hear you. How do I put those bags down? Three things, I'm done. One thing, number one, change how you relate to people. Adam and Eve, they were in love with each other in the cool of the day. Then guilt showed up and they began fighting. Don't think guilt doesn't hurt your marriage. Well, I just said a whole mouthful and you missed me. Don't think guilt doesn't hurt your marriage. Don't think it doesn't hurt your relationships. Think about it. Adam and Eve had it perfect. They had no clothes. Thank you, Jesus. They had no in-laws. Y'all know the difference between in-laws and outlaws? Outlaws are wanted. Anyway, so. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Big Shirley. And then um, they didn't have no burnt food. Remember when you was in love and your wife couldn't cook and you ate it anyway because you was in love? Ain't no men going to say amen right there. You just ate there and you had tears coming down your face. And she said, what you crying for? And you're like, because it tastes so good. And what you was really crying for, because I miss my mama's stove right about now. That was, <laughs> and no burnt food. Everything was perfect. And one day because of guilt, look at, they start blaming each other. It leaked into their family. One of their sons winds up killing the other son. Why? Because they didn't feel like they were forgiven. But let me tell you how good God is. This ain't even part of the message. Let me hurry run through this. If you go back and read the genealogy of Adam, do we all agree that Cain killed Abel? We all agree that Cain lived? If you go back and read the genealogy of Adam, Cain's not even listed in Adam's genealogy. You can find that in Genesis. I'll find it for you. It goes on and says, and, and Adam uh, got with uh, Eve and they beget. So and so, you know what beget means? They begetting it on. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and they beget this, beget. And it says, and Adam and Eve got together and they beget Seth. It says nothing about Cain. 
Nothing about Cain. We just agreed that Cain existed. We all know that Cain killed Abel. But when God gets ready to write your history, he rewrites your history. And it's not that it didn't happen. It's just that he took it out. It's no longer there. Cain and Abel are no longer in the genealogy because God doesn't remember you by what you've done. He remembers you about what you're about to do. Hey, that's bad right there. That is bad. That right. I didn't get that from Bible school. I got that out of Dunbar High School. Come on, somebody. Whew, that's bad. Even Paul, listen, this whole deal on forgiveness is, and, and, and guilt, it, it relates to how you treat other p- people. Even Paul, when he was in prison, had a ton of agony, wrote people of Philippi who were in trouble. The whole theme of Philippians is be joyful, and Paul's writing that from a prison cell. And in and, and one place he says, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. In prison, talking like that because he was, knew he was a citizen of heaven, that this earth was in his home. He's just passing through. Philippians 2, if you have any encouragement, don't miss that. If you have any encouragement, Paul says if. In other words, it's not automatic. You're going to have to choose joy. You're going to have to choose whether you're going to have a bad day or a good day. Get mad at me all you want. I'm just reading the Bible. You choose how you go through it. He says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the Spirit and purpose. Verse 5 of that says, having the same mindset of Christ. When you don't put the weights down, number two, it changes how you relate to God. Hebrews says this, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the Christ, scorn and the shame. Let me read that last part. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scoring its shame. Do you know who the joy was? Everybody in this room. Everybody in this world, he thought about, he looked in the future in 2024 and saw you sitting here in church and he goes, man, I got to go to the cross. They may have to get rid of some baggage today. Hear me, I'm telling you, I'm not making it up. That's what that scripture says. God doesn't live in time. He is time. Come on. He makes what, he lives outside of time. He's alpha, he's omega, he's the first, he's the last, he's the beginning and the end. He looked into time and said in 2024, somebody's going to be at church on the first day of September and they may need some forgiveness and need to get rid of some baggage. Therefore, I go to the cross with joy. So everybody at West and South and Brownfield and listening can be set free in the name of Jesus. If you believe that, give God a good shout of praise. Here's number three. When you put the weight down, it changes how you're used by God. When you are truly forgiven and you're not walking under the weight of guilt, you start caring about what he cares about. And that is seeing people get set free. So I preached all of that to get to this one point. You, there's only one thing to do today. Give all your guilt to the Lord. Give all your shame to the Lord. Well, and immediately when I say that, I guarantee you the enemy started talking to somebody and said, but not you. He doesn't know about this. I don't, but he does. And I just gave you scripture. I didn't preach my opinion today. My, my opinion is it's meaningless. My opinion won't change any of you, but that's why we preach the word of God because that's what sets us free. And that word should be higher than any lie that's coming in your mind right now. You have a choice to leave here with your head down, your hands in your pocket, trying to figure out how you're going to get God to love you. Or you can leave here like this with your head up high knowing He already does love you. And He loves you too much to leave you with shame and guilt. Too much. It's your choice, but you're going to have to surrender it. And you're going to have to give it. Some of you will dismiss this. And next week, you're going to come in here heavy. And you're going to blow it off and do nothing with it. And here's what happens. When God speaks to you about laying stuff down, when you don't lay it down, the Word of God says that spirit comes on you seven times stronger than it did the last time. So some of you, you already heard. You, you, how many altar calls have you already missed by being stubborn? By being prideful? 
by caring about what everybody thinks in here. I don't care what none of y'all think. Well, you ought to. I, you know, I'm going home, I'm going to sleep like this. It's nap Sunday. That's how much I care. Why? Because none of you died on the cross for me. You're not qualified to judge me, and I'm not qualified to judge you. That's why the Word of God says, Do not, don't judge one another. Now, don't, we are, as believers, we're called to judge fruit, and that's it. Not motives, not anything else, just fruit. You're not qualified to judge people when they come to the altar. Oh, I can't believe they're going to the altar. I seen them last night at the club. Well, what was you doing in the club? Oh, we there now. I was at their Annie's barbecue last Sunday, and they was lit. I mean, they know. Oh, well, you're the one that brought the ice chest. How about we just quit pointing fingers at each other and say, God, I'm here by myself, and I just need some forgiveness in my life, and I can't help what they do. I can't help what nobody else does. I just, I'm tired. I'm tired. I'll be 54 this week. I don't have time. That, you still got time to go shopping. Uh, <laughs> that's what Labor Day's for, to go. <laughs> it's me and Kevin Evans' birthday. My godson, we had the same birthday. He's cuter than I am, by that much. But we got to get rid of all this stuff and lay it all down. So first I want to pray over you because I think the enemy, before I give this altar call, I think the enemy's already whispering in your ear. You got to get here. You know how traffic is out here. You know, it's already met. Father, I take every thought captive right there that would lift itself up against the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Any thought that would raise itself up against the truth of God's word that we have established from the very beginning today, that he that the Son set free is free indeed, that I don't have to carry baggage, I don't have to carry weight. It's a choice. It's a choice to be weighted down, and today I choose freedom. I need my altar team to move as fast as they can as they're moving. Lawrence, lead us in the song. I want to hear this song. Make this your declaration. I hope at every campus they're singing this song. It's time to get rid of it. We're not going to bow our heads today. We're not going to close our eyes. If you got something you need to surrender, I don't want you to wait. I want you to come right now. You got some guilt. You got some shame. You got something else. Now I got a, this. Come on, let's bring it to the altar right now. Don't wait on nobody else. Come on. I know in a room this big, there are people that have been carrying that way longer than you should have. It's just a fact. It's just a fact. I'm going to turn this back over to our South Campus and our Brownfield Campus.